Hello, my name is John Hall. I'm the board chair for the Linux Professional Institute and the president of Linux International. Our talk today is about free and open source software for developers and managers. For those of you who don't know me, I've been in the computer industry for about 50 years. I've worked on a wide variety of different operating systems. And for the last 30 years, uh, almost exclusively Unix and Linux. I've had a wide variety of jobs, programmer, systems administrator, author, um, product manager, marketing manager, educator, CEO, in companies both small and large, mostly large. One of the things I pride myself on is being pragmatic about the use of software. I believe in solving the problem and doing the job. And that's what I pride myself in doing. The topics that we're going to cover today, which have been approved by your management and you, is what is open source and how did it get started? What are copyrights, patents, licensing, public domain, and creative commons, and how do they affect software? Why do software developers like open source? What things do open source developers like, which is slightly different? How open source can improve uh, programmer skills? Some case studies about how free and open source software changed businesses and made them better. And how to start with free and open source software and hardware, which we call FOSS H. First, what is open source? Open source is giving people the access to and the right to use the source code to create products. It can be binary only products or it can be free software products, but that's basically what it is. And it also needs the knowledge of how to turn that source code into the binaries that run on your systems. A lot of times it isn't enough just to have the source code itself. You really need to also know the procedures and policies to turn that source code into the binaries. How did open source begin? A lot of people feel that open source began at the time of Richard Stallman and the GNU project and things like that. But if you go back far enough in time, you realize that most of the software that was created in the early days of computers was open. It was transmitted to people as source code. This because the computers of those days were physically very large and very expensive, but logically, the memory size, the CPU speed was very small, and there were very few of them. And the number of different computers built in different ways with different operating systems, if they had an operating system, did not justify creating a binary distribution to send it out. Many of the computers had no operating system at all. When you compiled your program, you compiled them directly onto the bare hardware and they were tailored to the system that they were running on. In the very old days, because of these very large and expensive and few computers, there were also no professional programmers. The people that did programming were physicists, electrical engineers, uh, scientists, educators, some business people, but they weren't in the business of creating software, particularly software for other people. They were creating the software for their own use. And once they got finished with the software, they would say, well, what am I going to do with this? I'm not in the business of selling software. I don't want to provide support. I don't want to create extensive documentation. So what they did was they gave it to user groups of large computer companies like D the Digital, the Digital Equipment Corporation User Society called DECUS, or IBM's User Society, which is called SHARE. And these user groups would put this code into libraries and then distribute them to people that wanted them, basically for the cost of the distribution. There was no license fee associated with it. They were registered gratis. In fact, at that time, there was no copyright on, that could be applied to software. So we'll cover more of that later. You also had bulletin boards where people could upload their software to the bulletin board via modem and telephone line. 
and people could then pull the software down free of charge or perhaps a small access fee to the bulletin board. Desktop computers, when they came along, started to create the binary only market. Now you had the IBM PC, you had the Altair, you had other computers. CPM came out as an operating system. It was distributed in binary only form and people made little programs that were run on top of them also distributed in binary form because the market was big enough to do that. At the same time, or about the same time, Unix was created in 1969 at Bell Laboratories, and it started to progress. It went out to universities like Berkeley and MIT and CMU, but Unix was not free even though it was distributed in source code form to these universities, the universities had a campus-wide uh, license for the code. And they could then get the source code, compile it, put it on their systems, and use it to teach their students. However, if you were a commercial company and you wanted to use Unix, you had to pay a horrendous source code license to AT&T and you were limited to the number of systems that you could put that operating system on. Typically, it was only one. And you had to have the serial number for that system and tell AT&T what that was. So Unix was not free, even though at universities the source code was, was handed out quite uh, liberally amongst the students. Now, at one period of time, Certain companies like Sun Microsystems said, hey, I want to be able to distribute this Unix system as a product, and I'm going to do it in binary-only form. So telephone company AT&T, would you give us a license, a distributor's license, to be able to do this? And instead of paying $160,000 for a license for Unix, we might only have to pay, or end users might have to pay only $350 for the license. And so companies started to distribute the Unix systems instead of in source code form, in binary form. And at MIT, there was a student named Richard Stallman, also known as RMS, who didn't like this. He liked getting Unix in source code form. He liked seeing how it worked. He liked the fact he could change it. He liked the fact he could fix the bugs. And so when he started getting the binary only versions of Unix sent to him, he said, no, I'm going to start this project called GNU, which stands for GNU is not Unix, a play on words, in September of 1983. And it's going to be a complete operating system with the source code that people can use. Now, he could have started by writing the very center of the, of the operating system, the kernel, but the problem with that was that there were no applications to run on top of it. And so he recognized this as a problem. He said, OK, I'm going to start with an application called Emacs, a text editor. And I'm going to make sure that Emacs runs on all these other different operating systems like MVS and VMS and all these different Unix systems and HPUX and all these other systems <coughs> so that people can use the same text editor with the same commands across all these different systems. And of course, programmers use text editors, and they really liked this concept that no matter what system they went to to program on, they knew how to use the text editor already. And after that, they started to join the GNU project because they saw the vision, and they started creating other applications like compiler suites, C compiler, C++ compiler, Fortran. They had other shells. They had programs that were run, all contributed to the GNU project. In October the 4th of 1985, Richard Stallman created the Free Software Foundation in order to be able to finance the development of this. And at that time, all the different programs had different licenses, so he straightened that out by inventing the GPL, the one license that could be applied to all these different programs, 
that people could understand and people could use the license to create their own programs of free software, even if they weren't on the GNU project. And the first version of the GPL came out in February of 1989. Now, what does the GPL really mean? Well, every time you write a piece of software, whether it's a full program or even part of a program, in the United States law, automatically, there is a copyright that's associated with it. The, the code is automatically copyrighted. And so if people want to use that code, they have to find the copyright holder and ask their permission. The license tells people how they can use that software in very specific ways, you know, where they can distribute the source code for it, whether they can distribute the binaries. That's what the license does. And the GPL had four main ports, points to it. Point number one, to allow the user or the, the, the holder of the software to run the software for any purpose whatsoever. Some people come along and say, I don't want the military to use my software because I don't like the military. And other people say, I don't want banks to use my software because I don't like banks. And by the time you take a large project and put all of those different restrictions on it, you find out that nobody can use the software for any purpose. So the GPL very specifically says that you can use the software that is covered by the GPL for any purpose whatsoever. The second main point, that you get the source code to look at and see how the software works to inspect the software and to change the source code if you need to change it to meet your own needs. Third point, you get to redistribute copies of the source code and copies of the binary code to anybody who needs them. And the final point is that you get to publish modified versions of the software, not just the software as it came from somebody else, but if you modify it, you can publish those modified versions and you have to make those modifications available to the people that you send the binaries to. Now, GNU wasn't the only project going on at the time. There was also Project Athena at MIT, and in Project Athena, they created two main parts of it, the X Windows system, a client server system that many Unix and Linux systems use even to this day, and Kerberos, that's a network security system, and allows you to have secure transactions over the network. At University of California, Berkeley also had a project called BSD Software, and they had a lot of software that was written, not just BSD Unix, but they also had uh, software like SendMail, which is a mail transport system, and very popular, you know, had huge, handled huge amounts of mail being sent around the fledgling internet. BSD Lite was a version of the BSD Unix distribution that was free of AT&T encumbered software. So you no longer had to have an AT&T license in order to be able to distribute the Berkeley software system of Unix. There were also databases, some of which came from also from the University of California, Berkeley, one called Ingress, that was a relational database in the early days. And Ingress was started as a project at the university. It was a free software project. And the person who started the project, Michael Stonebreaker, left the University of California, Berkeley to start a company called the Ingress Company to sell support and extensions and things like that. Later on, as object-oriented databases came into vogue, he went back to the university, started up another program to create an object-oriented database that was also relational, and he called it Postgres. And today, Postgres still exists as free software. He then Michael Stonebreaker left the university, started a company to give support to Postgres. And so now you can see how you can start to make money. Even though the software itself is free, the support and the education and the training and uh, paying for bug fixes and paying for extensions is what you pay for. Now, 
As Richard Stallman was creating more and more and more of the GNU system, the part that was still missing was the kernel, the part that schedules tasks, it schedules memory, it schedules I.O. devices, and all those types of things. There was plans to do a microkernel-based kernel called the herd, but it was not moving forward very rapidly. And in September of 1991, a young college student named Linus Torvalds said, I'm going to create a kernel for the GNU system just for fun. It's not going to be a big project. You know, who would like to help me? Who would like to join with me? And he started to create a team of people to create this kernel. But their goal was not to create a kernel that was simply free of charge. Their goal was to create a good Unix kernel, the best Unix kernel. And they got together to do that. Uh, if you look at that picture, Linus is on the far right of that picture. Then, by 1993, late 1993, the kernel was in good enough shape that distributions of all the code started in. And you had code of things like uh, soft landing systems, Yggdrasil, Debian, Red Hat, Slackware, and others. Some of these systems are no longer in existence. Some of them are still in existence. They started with kernel 0 0.99999, uh, almost version 1.0 of the kernel, um, but they wanted to get out their distributions early. In early 1994, version 1.0 of the kernel came out, but it was only for Intel and AMD. It was only a 32-bit system. I met Linus Torvalds in May of 1994 when he went to Decus and he was giving two talks there and I convinced him to do a port of the Linux kernel from the 32-bit Intel and AMD systems to the 64-bit Alpha processor that was a reduced instruction set uh, processor and was 64-bit and at that time was the fastest microprocessor on the face of the earth. And so Linus started that port and digital helped him with engineering support and things like that. We helped to promote Linux as a solution for customers. Now let's stop with that and take a look at some licensing to give you a better idea of what's going on. In the early days of code, there was no uh, copyright that could be assigned to software. So the way that you protected your intellectual property that you had created was through a contract law. You would sit down with your lawyers talking to the people who produce the software or the people who were going to, sell, that were going to buy the software and you would work out a contract that says how many systems could this software go on, uh, how many people could use it, uh, how much was it going to cost, what was the maintenance fee, you know, all those types of things. And, and also, you know, what is the measure of quality in this product? How many bugs are we going to see? Things like that. All of that went into a contract. And of course, this took many months to do this contract. It was very expensive to do this contract. But on the other hand, they may be selling you a single copy of a compiler for a language like COBOL, and they were going to charge you 100,000 US dollars for a single copy that was going to run on a single system. And that was in 1973 dollars. And I know this because I negotiated some of those contracts. Now, obviously, if you're going to be producing this to sell to millions of people, you can't sit down with millions of people and go through a contract like this. And so eventually, copyright was assigned to software and in the beginning it was to the ROMs that were used in games because what was happening was the game producers would design a board they would write the game they would put it into a ROM the ones and zeros that would go into read-only memory and then their competitors would come along copy the board copy the ROM and sell their board and their ROM for much less money than the company that had designed it in the first place. 
And so these companies went to the government and said, we need to have a copyright on the ROMs, the ones and zeros in this ROM, and we need to, so we can sue these other companies and stop them from selling what they're just copying from us. So event, originally, copyright was given to that, and then later on, copyright was assigned to the source code and to the binaries of programs that were generated by companies as closed source. Then, uh, when you get the, have the copyright assigned to that, what you need is a license that tells you what to do. So as people started creating these millions and millions of copies of the software in, for either the IBM PC or the CPM systems, you developed what was called the end user license. So EULA, the end user license agreement. And that was the license that told the end user what they could do with the software. Now, that's for closed source proprietary software, software you pay for. There was other licenses that came out and these were called open source licenses. And some of them were permissive, meaning that they didn't put many restrictions on you, just a few. And others were not permissive or restrictive. And these may have other things you had to do. For example, make your source code changes available to other people. It forced you to do that. That's why they're called restrictive or not permissive. And the GPL is a perfect example of that. Uh, there's also public domain licensing, where you basically give up your copyright. You say, this software is now in the public domain, and you can do anything you want with it. You don't have to say where it came from. You don't have to acknowledge you wrote it. You don't have, in fact, we don't want you to because people might hold us responsible for bugs and things like that. So public domain gives you no control over your software whatsoever. And I do not recommend to people that they put their software into the public domain. Creative Commons is a different type of licensing. It's licensing for data, licensing for art. And so if you write a book, you could license it through Creative Commons. If you write, create a movie or a song, and Creative Commons gives you specific things that you can ask for of the person using your art, whether you can have uh, use it for commercial use or only if you give it away, if you want to make changes to it or not, if you want to have attribution for what you've done or not, you can say this through Creative Commons. And Creative Commons share alike is much like GPL because it makes gives the same requirements to the end user as it did to the developer in the first place. Now, we're going to stop there for a second and we're going to talk about software piracy. The stealing of proprietary software that's being sold by various people. And this is important to free software, and you'll see why in a moment. Software piracy is particularly strong in desktop software. In server software, it's typically sold for more money, and people who are businesses and governments would not dare to steal it because they would be found out. But for desktop software, in Asia and Africa, 96% of the desktop software is pirated. It's not paid for. In Brazil, it's 84% of the desktop software is pirated. In the United States, one of the richest countries in the world, and one where we generate a lot of software, and you would think we would obey the laws, 34% of the desktop software is pirated. And when you pirate software, a couple things come into view. Number one, the people that created the software and are depending on the revenue of that software sale to keep their company going, don't see that revenue. And they either have to raise the price of their software to the people that do purchase it, or they go out of business. And that's one problem. Another problem is 
that if you steal the software, if you pirate the software, you can't expect to get software updates. You can't expect to get a telephone number or an email address. We can send a problem report and maybe somebody will help you solve it. You can't expect to get uh, security bug fixes and things like that or be notified when they happen. You can't expect any of those things and this makes the software less valuable to you than if you had purchased the license and the support. So the BSA is an organization that is funded by companies like Microsoft and Oracle that go around looking for people who are pirating software. And if they find them, they then take them to court and get the court to punish them, maybe give them a really bad fine, maybe uh, you know, make them so that they can't use the software anymore. And as an example of this, there is, was a company called Ball Music. They made guitar strings. They were very fine guitar strings. It was a very nice company, small. But they would take PCs and they would put design software on them for their engineers. And then when the engineers wanted to get a faster system, they take the older one, give it to a secretary or the manager or something like that, but leave the licensed software on it the people wouldn't be using it, the secretary wouldn't be using it, the manager wouldn't be using it, but that still violated the software agreement, the end user license agreement. They had a systems administrator who was fired, left there in a, in a bad way, went to the BSA and told them what was happening at Ball Music. And the BSA came, found that the software was improperly licensed, they didn't mean to license it improperly. It just happened, but it didn't make any difference. And Ball Music had to pay $40,000 penalties, and their name was all over Silicon Valley as being a bad company for pirating software. This embarrassed the CEO of the company, a man named Sterling Ball, and he told his company that they had to get rid of every single piece of proprietary software in the company and use only free and open source software from then on. And they did that in less than a year and they never went back to using proprietary software again. And Sterling Ball said, this was the best idea I ever had. Another thing that is happening right now because of this issue is that a lot of these proprietary companies are moving to what we call a subscription basis or web-based type of system because it's harder to steal the software that way. And because more people, because a greater percentage of people who use the software now have to pay for it, they can pay a smaller fee for using the software because more people are paying for it legitimately. Now, how does software piracy hate or hurt free software. It hurts free software because when I come to a country like Brazil and I say, look what would happen if you used free software, a lot of the people look at me and smile and they say, oh, mad dog, all of our software is free. And it makes it harder for me to convince them that they should be using free software where they can pull the software down off the net use it and pay local software people to make that software better and to make it fit their needs better and to make it work with other software better than to use this pirated closed source software that they get no help with, no bug fixes, and doesn't necessarily work the way they want it to. And we'll see more about this later on. So let's take a closer look at the permissive versus restrictive licensing we mentioned before. The term open source is also used in free software, but typically open source looks at the more permissive licenses, the MIT license, the BSD license, the Apache license, because none of these force the distribution of, this, of the source code or the fixes beyond the developers. The end users may get a binary only, not the changes that were done to the original software. 
not a pointer to the original software. It depends on the license, but it benefits the developers because the developers can find software that makes their developing job easier, but it doesn't force them to pass on that information or their bug fixes to the next person or to the end user. Free software, on the other hand, the restrictive license, benefits the developers and the end users. The developers are benefited because they get the original code, they get bug fixes put in by other people, they get extensions put in by other people, and it benefits the end users because the developers have to pass on all of those changes to the end user. It doesn't mean that necessarily that they have to actually hand them the source code, but they have to make available to the end users where the source code is. So it's the access to the source code that's required, not the actual distribution of the source code to the end users. Now, we've talked a lot about copyright and licensing and things. We should also talk briefly about patents. Patents are different from copyright is because they're not a specific instance of the software. It is about an idea. It's about a concept. And it should be something that's new. It should not have existed before. We say if it existed before, there is prior art. There is other people who have created this idea, this patent, and therefore the person who's applying for this patent or has this patent has simply copied them. It can't be an obvious solution. And this is often maligned by people who get a patent on something which is an obvious solution. And later on, they try and block other people from using this obvious idea. So these people have to take them to court. There's also the concept of submarine, submarine patents. Patents that are taken out on new ideas. People then use those ideas to create products. The patent holder just sits there. They don't make themselves known. And then eventually they say, oh, you're making a million or two million dollars a year off of software based on my patent. Therefore, I want a copy of or I want some of that money that you're making on this. And they take them to court and force them to pay this. This is known as a submarine patent because it kind of surfaces after a long period of time, comes up above water. One of the most famous cases of this was the Unisys Corporation and the Huffman lossless encoding technique. Unisys had bought the patent or developed a patent on this technique, and it was used in lots of different places uh, in the Unix uh, Compress program. It was published in textbooks. It was a very simple method of implementation for compression. And so everybody used it. And years later, Unisys says, oh, we have that patent. Uh, you have those GIFs, those little images, you want to compress them? Well, you're using our patented uh, algorithm, therefore you have to owe us money. And because of this, the PNG method of compression was invented just to get around the use of this. And GIFs kind of disappeared from the marketplace for a long period of time until the patent ran out and now GIFs are back again. This brings about another interesting concept, that of patent trolls. A patent troll is somebody, they don't lend any real value to the market or value to the patent. They just go around looking for patents that people have that they think might be valuable and they buy them up and then they go find people who are inadvertently using them even and say, oh, you owe us money. And patent trolls are something to look out for. Now, people say, well, free software must be more susceptible to patents than closed source software. But it doesn't make any difference. The patent trolls will come after you, whether it's open source or whether it's closed source. There is an organization that allows you to pool all of your patents. And if a patent troll comes after one person, everybody fights them. But even on closed source code, a patent troll can go to a judge, get an injunction against you, 
to force you to show them your source code. They can see the patent and then they can sue you too. So unfortunately, this is not, this is a problem. We don't have a real good solution for it. We just deal with it as it comes along. Um, not every country has the same laws on patents. Brazil's laws may be less stringent. And you might say, oh, we're only going to distribute our software inside of Brazil. We don't have to worry as much about this. But if you want to export your product to some other country, you may be, or you may have to really look hard at patent and copyright protections in these other countries. Now, the last piece of intellectual property we're going to talk about is trademarks. This is the only intellectual property that Richard Stallman really likes. Um, you can think of a trademark like this swoosh on a Nike shoe. Lots of people can make tennis shoes, but when you see the swoosh on the shoe, you know it's made by Nike, and you can assume that there's a quality that goes into it. So a trademark sets expectations of people as to the quality of a product, and this is one of the things that Richard Stallman likes. Now, you can handle, you can use trademarks with open source source code, too. You can put your trademarks into the source code, and if anybody wishes to use your source code, they have to strip out all of that trademark information to do that. And this is one thing that an organization called Scent OS did with Red Hat Software. Scent OS stripped all the trademarks that Red Hat in their, had in their source code out of the code, and then they built a distribution called Scent OS that was basically bug for bug compatible with Red Hat. And Red Hat said, okay, this is perfectly fine. You know, what this is doing is allowing us to increase the number of people that are using basically our code. And some of these people would never buy a license from us. They would never buy support from us, but they are still using our code. And someday they may have a company that is big enough that they'll say, we need the type of support that Red Hat creates. We need Red Hat to do work for us. And they will then use Red Hat code and buy Red Hat service. So now let's talk about what do programmers value. And there was a study done of thousands and thousands of programmers that they asked the programmers to tell them the things that they value in a job. They then took those thousands and thousands of things and boiled them down to a list that was fairly long. And they submitted this list to groups of people and said, what do you value? So there was one group of people called dev.to and they went through the list and they ordered what they thought was valuable and another group called Hacker News that did the same thing. And the most amazing thing was that these two completely separate group of people working completely independently of each other came up with the top three bullet points being exactly the same. The first bullet point that was most important to both groups was a work-life balance. They didn't want to work all the time. They needed some time for their family and, and rest and everything else, but they liked their work. And so they wanted to balance this. That was the most important thing. The second most important thing to them was to work on and have a high quality code base because this meant that their job of doing programming would be easier because they weren't having to overcome a poor set of code they were working with. And likewise, they wanted to maintain that code base as high quality because into the future, this meant that they would be having an easier job of maintaining even the code that they themselves had written. The third thing was flexible work arrangements. A lot of these people were young. They wanted to be able to work from home. They wanted to be able to work in the office. They wanted to come in, in an early in the morning and leave early or come in late at night or late, later in the afternoon and leave late at night. They wanted it to be flexible. After these 
three main points, they started to diverge a little bit. The dev.to people said, we want the, the path of growth to be good for junior developers. We want to see people come in from the bottom and grow inside the organization. The other group said, we want to have impressive team members, team members that are known in the community that are really brilliant because we want to learn from them. Dev.to said, we want you to promote from within, just like you're bringing in the junior developers and they work their way up. We want to make sure that you're not going to go out there and just hire in senior management, senior programmers above us. We want the growth from within. Hacker News said, we want a diverse team. We want women. We want black people. We want Chinese. We, we don't want people to be all white male. End of discussion. We want to have diversity. So all of these things went, went into what they value. Eating lunch together, being able to sit there and change ideas, and not only ideas about work, but ideas about life. But you'll notice one thing about these lists. None of them say anything about money. They don't say, oh, I have to make you know huge amounts of money and stuff, because that's almost... An, an assumed thing. You're going to be paid enough to, to be valuable, to be valued for whatever you do. And so we're just going to ignore that altogether and concentrate on the things that we really appreciate. So what that was programmers in general. Now, what do open source programmers like? They like the visibility of their creativity. When you have a closed source project, Microsoft Office or Microsoft Operating System or Oracle Database, you never see the names of the developers who worked on this. They're invisible. But with open source, you see the people who worked on it. You see the people answering the bugs. You know who they are. And you see the, the things that they do. And this is visibility is something that the programmer can feel good about. Now, you don't necessarily have these things visible on the competitive features, the stuff that you're basing your sale on. But this is more on the software, which is there for everybody. And even that software can be very well written. It can be, be very, very efficient. efficient and, and people have like, like to have the names on that. A lot of open source developers also like talking to customers and users. In proprietary systems, you hardly ever see the developers talking to customers and users. And of course, not every developer likes to do that. Some developers are kind of shy. They don't like to do that. And some customers, you really don't want anybody talking to them. But for the most part, the customers and developers get along very fine. And the customers are understanding that sometimes things take time to fix and things like that. And with open source, when you get the bug report, a lot of times you get the bug fix that comes along with it. And so people can work together as this larger collaborative group. How can open source improve as programmer skills? Well, first of all, they can see hundreds of thousands of code projects out on SourceForge and GitHub and GitLab. And they able to look at very well written code that has been written by lots of different types of programmers at different skill levels. But they could see code that was written by brilliant programmers. And they can see the code that's written by other users and coders. And they can push for better coding. They know their code is going to be seen by other coders and users. They're not going to put out code that they are not proud of. And they are also not going to put into that code bad comments about potential suppliers or customers or users because they know that their source code is be as visible as their binaries are. They also have open testing. One of the reasons why the Linux kernel, almost from day one, 
was very, very stable, even as it was being rapidly developed, was every time a new set of patches went into the kernel, they would release the kernel and 10,000 people would pull it down and install it on their system and tell them what was right and what was wrong. And so the kernel was incrementally improved over time. Before we talk about case studies about FOSS H businesses, we have to take a look at what businesses of operating systems were like way back when. In the very early days, like we talked about, you had proprietary operating systems that had different types of capabilities. And companies sold their operating systems based on the capabilities of that particular operating system on that particular hardware. When Unix came along, a lot of the companies like Digital and Hewlett Packard and IBM and Sun Microsystems took the basic Unix software and improved it with features that they thought their customers would like. And the customers did like the features. Each one of these companies was spending about a billion dollars a year in improving their version of Unix. Maybe Sun was spending two billion dollars a year. But as soon as a new version of Unix came out, the customer would look at that and say, oh, that's a great feature. When can I have it on my Sun system? When can I have it on my IBM system? When can I have it on my Hewlett Packard system? And you would say, well, you can't because this is, a, this is a feature of our version of Unix. And the customer says, well, then it's useless to me. The customer wanted the same functionality across all their different hardware. And the Unix companies did not see that, even though these Unix companies were also selling lots and lots and lots of Windows NT or Windows operating systems across all of their Intel platforms. And so when Linux came along, here was the one operating system that started to go across all these different platforms, just like Emacs in the early days, all these different platforms, it worked exactly the same way. And this is what the customers wanted. So how does open source in software and hardware change a business? Well, for years, people would talk about the glories of open source software and how much programmers liked it and stuff, and isn't it great? And about 10 years ago, I made this revelation to myself. People do not buy hardware. They do not buy software. What they buy is a solution to a problem. They have a problem, they need a solution, and it just so happens that computer hardware and computer software is perfect in a lot of cases for solving that problem. And so you move the focus from a product which you are creating to a solution or a service. And so people would say, well, I'm going to make my product open source, but what I'm going to be selling is my service. And I'm going to sell it to as many people as humanly possible. Now, if you want to take a look at how this happened some time ago, and a lot of people didn't realize it, IBM at one time sold laptops, small servers, all these different hardware, and they would talk about the hardware they had and the software they had, MVS, VM, you know, the 360, 370 computer systems, the mainframes. And then all of a sudden, about the year 1999, they made a, a statement that they were going to sell off their laptop and their small server division to a company called Lenovo. Because that's, that hardware only had a 3 to 5% profit margin on it. And this was not enough for a company like IBM to survive. And so they made a decision to sell off all that hardware to Lenovo and to take 
the almost two billion dollars worth of money that they had for that and buy a company called Price Waterhouse Cooper that sold solutions. And IBM doubled the size of their solution department by buying Price Waterhouse Cooper. And their solution department created a 19% profit margin on solutions. So they redirected their money and their focus on solutions. But the other thing that happened for this is it freed up the solution providers inside of IBM to use any company's laptops, any company's small servers. It didn't have to come from IBM. If the customer wanted an Apple laptop or an Apple phone, then the IBM solution to providers were happy to use that for them. And this created IBM's new marketing, which they've been using for the past 30 years. When you walk through the airport, all you see is IBM business solutions. You don't see hardware mentions. You don't see software mentions. The only possible exception to this is Watson for AI. So now we come to different case studies of free and open source software and hardware and how it changed businesses. There's a company very close to where I live in Nashua, New Hampshire, which had a very large piece of software that was ported to different operating systems. They had five engineers who would do this porting and then the engineers would also have to do quality control on every single port. And every time the company came out with a new version of with new functionality of their product, they'd have to test it on all these different systems that they had put the software to. They found out that the customers that asked them to do the port might buy one or two or three more licenses, but really not enough additional licenses to justify the cost and the effort of doing the port. The five engineers who did this were not happy with this porting. They weren't happy doing the QA. They wanted to write new features and new functionality that would be valuable to all of their customers. So the president of the company looked at this and said, well, what part of our product do people really value? What do they really want to pay for? And he realized that there were some little pieces of his software that large companies, enterprise companies, really appreciated. Small companies would hardly use that. And small companies would be happy with just the base product. And small companies would probably not pay them very much for the base product anyway. So they created a community of companies around their product. And they said, you can pull down the source code of our product for free. You can pull down the binaries and use them for free. You pull them down from our server. And when you pull them down, we look at who you are. And if you are mom and pop, the small company, we say, congratulations for using our software that the community has put together. You know, go ahead and use it. And if you ever get really big, come back to us because we have other software you may want. But if their name was General Motors or the US military or the government, when they pulled down the software, they would look at the company would look at that and say, oh, you need to buy these modules that'll really help you run our software. And these companies would buy that and they would buy the training and they would buy the support. And so the company made more money than ever by taking the part of their product that people were not going to pay for and making that free and open. And the community helped to do additional ports and the community did all the QA on the base software. And so they lowered the amount of work it took to maintain their software across all those platforms. They lowered their cost of sales Typically, cost of sales in software is about 36% of the retail value. Well, because they could see 
the people pulling the software down. They could target those large companies and they cut their cost of sales from 36% to 5%. So they made more money than ever in making a large portion of their product free. Over the years, the free software part of the community might say, well, we can make, we can duplicate the functionality of those little modules you're selling. And just about the time that they would do that, the company would say, oh, we were going to open up those modules anyway and make them free. But in the meantime, we've written these extra modules that go on top of even that. And those are the things you need to buy now. The next piece of software we're going to talk about is something called Project.net. Project.net is a project management system. It is very good. It is very powerful. It is very complex. And the company that made it was going out of business because they were only selling about two licenses per quarter because the licenses were $2,000 a piece. A friend of mine bought the company, looked at it, and said, you know, people that buy those licenses, 60% of them buy a support contract or they buy training because the product is complex. What would happen if I made the product free software? He made it free software and 2,000 people a quarter pulled the software down and 60% of them bought a support contract or training. And so they made a huge amount of additional money. Plus the community helped with changes and updates and bug fixes and things like that. Blender was a closed source product. It was used to make 3D movies and 3D games, very sophisticated. It was for advanced users, advanced developers, but the company that made it was going out of business. All of the users liked Blender so much that they all contributed money. And they said, okay, we're going to uh, make an open source project out of this. And they formed a nonprofit organization to do that, to hire a few programmers, to make money through grants and everything like that. And now Blender is very successful. It's a very powerful 3D development engine that is totally free. It can make movies, it can make games, it can do architectural 3D walkthroughs. It is very, very powerful and very successful. In Florida, there was a city and they had a staff of four people, three programmers and an operator. And the city needed software to run their police department, their tax department, their fire department, and city services. And they decided that they were going to use all free software to do this in what we call a LAMP stack. LAMP is the initials for Linux, Apache, MySQL as a database, and Perl or Python to tie these things together. We call it LAMP. These people, three developers and this operator developer, inside of six months, wrote all the software necessary to run the city, utilizing the database as both the storage of the data and the computational engine. The Apache web server acted as a server so that people could use their browsers to access the data. Linux, of course, was the operating system, and Perl and Python tied all these things together. Three programmers and a half programmer, half operator wrote all of this software. And they had people coming from states all over the, in the United States, even cities from all over the world, coming to see how they could possibly have done this. And it worked very well. The US Postal Service had a problem they needed to have sorting machines that could read the script, these zip codes, the handwritten zip codes, and print a little barcode along the bottom. They were going to use Go Unix, a proprietary version of Unix for this, but the license for Go Unix was $1,200 per system, 
and the post office needed a lot of these systems. They came to me and said, could we use Linux instead of SCO Unix? And I said, well, probably. And so they did, and they saved $4 million in SCO license fees. Bayer of supercomputers, in about 1995, there was this problem that supercomputers, companies like Cray and ECL and SGI, were going out of business. And people needed supercomputers to solve really hard problems. And two people, Dr. Thomas Sterling and Donald Becker at NASA, came up with a model of creating a supercomputer out of free software, the GNU Linux system, and commodity hardware, commodity PCs, that, it, that started out as being individual PC boxes connected with networking like Ethernet, and ended up being commodity systems built in a special way. So that now, today, all of the world's fastest computer systems run Linux as well as use commodity hardware. They found that they could give the power of a supercomputer for about 1 40th of the price. Embedded systems in the year 2000 were proprietary systems written by companies, uh, usually for Intel as the chip. And the people, their, their users start saying, well, we want our embedded systems to be able to use processors other than Intel, like ARM or Motorola. We want our embedded systems to be able to talk on the internet. Therefore, we need security that your systems don't have. We want our systems to be able to talk over TCP IP. You need a TCP IP stack. And all the embedded systems people said, oh my God, this is a lot of work. But then they said, wait a minute. There's already an operating system that's secure, already an operating system that does TCP IP, already an operating system that works across all these hardware things, and we don't need to write the compilers for them. And it's called Linux. And in one year, Linux became the most used operating system in designing new embedded systems. In St. Petersburg, Russia, there is a company there which is called a turbine test bed. There are five of these turbine test bed companies around the world, and they will take a turbine that typically may have steam running through it to generate electricity, or maybe water running through it to do hydroelectric power, and they will test the efficiency of that turbine design and allow the engineers who design the turbines to see the efficiency and to make changes to the design to make it more efficient. Four of these different turbine test beds use proprietary software written by a company. And if you need to have a change to that proprietary software for the engineers who use it, it may take 10 months for even the smallest change to be made and released by the company. The owner of the turbine test bed in St. Petersburg wrote his own software using Linux. He used GNU plot to plot out things. He used Tickle TK, a language for doing graphics. And he created software that the engineers can use. If they need a change, he can typically do it in three days. So to the engineers, to the end users, if they go with one set of turbine test beds, it takes 10 months for them to get the change they need. If they go with the person in St. Petersburg, it takes three days. And so I think you can see the value of using open source software or free software to St. Petersburg. Now people say, how do we start with free and open source software and hardware? Well, the most important thing in any piece of software or in any solution is a business plan. How do you make money from the software that you're writing? 
how what is the value of the software to you or to your user how much of the software can be free how much can you leverage off of use of free software in creating your product after that you may think to yourself is this a new product or conversion a lot of people with using closed source software they say oh you know just moving linux in and replacing it on the desktop it's a lot of work i have to train all these people and how to use this new system and they don't like it because they know how the old system worked well all that's true but if it's a new system nobody knows how it works nobody knows what it's supposed to look like and so if you create something that's efficient that does the job that is useful they will like it and nobody cares that's not using microsoft or oracle your training in a new system is the same whether you're using closed source or open source doesn't make any difference now, if you are converting, if you're taking an old system into new, some people will say, oh, yeah, it's different. But was the old project very buggy? And now when you write the code, those bugs disappear. Was the old software about to have to be replaced because the end of the license was up? Or the hardware was old and you couldn't get the software for the new piece of hardware, for the faster piece of hardware. There is a reason why you have to rewrite the software and a reason why you need to uh, make people change. And they will accept that. Again, when you, from a programming standpoint, how do you start with free and open source software? Well, there's a big difference between writing software in the kernel of the system where the special techniques have to be used and a, and a certain level of difficulty. But in end user programs, it's really the same as writing in any user level uh, code. You're using different tools. You have to become familiar with those tools. But more importantly, you should look out in places like SourceForge or GitHub or GitLab and look for the, for the free and open source software that's out there, understand what's there for you to use. Databases, geographical information software, you know, office products, all these different things, statistical products, math products, searching products, databases, it's all there, different types. And when you then realize all the different software is there, over 400,000 different packages generated by 26 million different programmers. You say, wow, I can utilize this software. All I have to do is obey the license. And you also want to start programming portably. You want your code to run as many different platforms as possible. And when you start doing that, you start realizing that you're anticipating problems as you go from platform to platform. And your code actually becomes better. You may want to look at things like the Linux standard base if you're working on Linux distributions. You want to say, I will code to the standard of the Linux standard base. So when I do create a binary and I only want to distribute that binary or I only want to deploy that binary on all these different Linux distributions, I can. You want to understand the portability trade-offs that you're working and how much you can improve the value of your code. You also want to decide whether you're going to be doing the style of programming. In the early days when I was doing programming, we did what we called waterfall programming. We would go out and get the product requirements. We would build the design specifications. We would pick the engineering team. We would generate the code. It might take a year to put the code out. And boom, like a waterfall, it was there. Today, most people do agile programming using something called DevOps. And it, it tends to release often lots of little fixes, incremental change, people working together as teams to create the software. All of this can be done with free software and closed source. I happen to think it can be done better 
with free software. One of the concepts of free software, the free software community, is prototype quickly, show it to your customer, see if the customer likes what they see. You know, be willing to throw away a prototype that doesn't work well. And once you get the customer agreeing that this is what they want, the understanding of the problem, then you can commit to creating production quality software. But be willing to throw away a prototype that doesn't work. So with that, I'm going to stop, and if people have any questions, I will try and answer them.